where we're shooting here in Malaysia is not a place that a lot of people will ever get to in their lives. So what it gives us the opportunity to do as filmmakers is to take the camera, take it to a remote location, take it into environments that most people will never get to see, create a story around that, and go in even tighter and closer and look at miniature worlds and make them so big that they become immersive. We decided to focus on telling the life cycle of two insects in particular, a butterfly from caterpillar through chrysalis to butterfly and of a praying mantis. And in between that story, we've tried to highlight what's unique about insects, the way they move, the way they eat, um, the way they have tricks for disguising themselves, for camouflage, just the extraordinary world of insects. It raises its head up. Yeah. I mean, it's just a leaf with legs. Yeah. Wow. He's now playing dead, isn't he? Yeah. But if you go collect these, all you have to do is touch the branch, and they just like drop. Drop. Okay. Later tonight, we're going to head out and do some nighttime collecting, which is always a lot of fun. Um, it's a really great time to be in the forest, actually. And what we'll probably be doing is setting up a light trap um, to catch sort of moths and cicadas usually, some flying beetles. If we look over there now, I don't know whether we can actually pick it up with a camera, but there's a bat taking full advantage of uh, the situation by flying in and taking out the bugs before they actually land in the trap. But here he comes, just coming towards us now. Probably head out into the forest, flashlights, a couple of containers, and see what we see. Here's something nice, Gillian. You can usually find some really amazing stuff at night, so just different insects, things like stick insects come out feet to feet at night, um, and they're much easier to find. During the day, they're just completely still. We're looking for unusual montage, uh, strange mouth parts for feeding, uh, bright colours, just unusual looking, you know, insects. So it could be absolutely anything. God, he's got some gnashes on him. Within the first 10 minutes, we found two poisonous animals. There's a huntsman spider over there. Uh, not dangerous, but can give a nasty bite. Great. And then within a couple of foot yeah. from there, we've got a scolopendra centipede sitting underneath a leaf there. I mean, they can put you in hospital. I mean, that's about six inches long under that leaf. So that's two nasties we've found so far. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we're seeing out here which we haven't seen before, so you, you don't know. This could be absolutely superb tonight. So we'll just keep plodding on, see what we find. takes place with the hut as a backdrop and we bought a hut, we secured a hut, this hut, um, which has a great sort of variety of, of textures and, uh, and timbers. So we're going to take it down from this location, take it apart 
and rebuild it in the location by the river, Matang. And then, once we've shot it there, then the whole thing will be then freighted back to England and rebuilt in an identical manner uh, in Oxford for our close-ups. The art director and the greenery designer had to research what plants would grow next door to each other so that everything is absolutely authentic. I am going to beat it up behind with the bamboo as well in behind the one coming through so you can have a, you know, you'll have a, this corner. The actual hero plants at this end, you know maybe the creeper stuff is coming from over in that that's, sort that's of area. And all the green oh, okay. in the back coming through, I was going to try and dust the whole a dead creeper. I mean, we can use, what I'm saying is we can use dead the, stuff. Yeah. The, 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 the creeper dead. Inside the hut is a citrus tree and is the bamboo, which are where you would normally find the caterpillar or the the mantid that are the focus of our story. Well, this is the uh, the fun bit for me now. That we're dressing the hut with uh, greenery to bring it to life. Nigel's now we've actually finished building it, and so we've got the the structure here. And now we want to bring all the lianas in from the, from the trees down into the hut. The story is that a, a big tree has fallen on the hut and left a trail of destruction um, in, in, in its path and crashed into the hut and given it this really nice angle so that uh, we can shoot on. Three D is how all of us see, of course. I mean, what's ironic about motion pictures is that more of them aren't done in three D because every day all of us see the world all the time in three D. And the reason is very simple and obvious because we have two eyes. These days, in three D movies, we find that we can entertain ourselves immersively by creating a camera system that works the same way as the human eye. So what we have to design and build is a three D rig, and a three D rig is basically has one eye that in theory is looking straight forward and you have a second camera or your other eye which is looking down and then what you need to do is you need to have what's called a beam splitter or what some people call a 50 percent mirror at a 45 degree angle this now allows both cameras to see in the same direction which of course is this way um, half of the image is reflected off the front of this surface uh, traveling up to this camera which is what we call the left eye camera uh, the other 50 uh, percent of the light or the image is passed through which goes to the camera back here, which we call the right eye camera. Borneo has the most amazing unsport rainforest, but also gave us the access that we needed for our cameras and for our trucks and for all the 3D technology that we needed. We were shooting in a very large, dense rainforest where light is subtracted and subtracted because the canopy sucks away all the light. The trees are basically light absorbers and the whole idea behind a rainforest is to try to take as much light at the highest level and it filters down and filters down and by the time you get to the ground where we were shooting most of the time there's very little left. There are little ways that you can cheat, you can bring lights in closer, you don't have to light up the entire rainforest area but in any event you can't get around the fact that you need a tremendous amount of light to do a film like this. So this is quite an ambitious shot. We've got the 3D rig going down underneath a waterfall. Access to it is through this hole. So we're dropping our camera rig, magazines, batteries, all of our gear right down through this hole. Beautiful. Okay, not yet, not yet, not yet. Got, got We've got a little bit of dressing going in, some greens and some dingle. Um, the idea is also to have the camera very gently drifting so that we get the 3D effect of the waterfall. Some of the most beautiful and virgin rainforest in Borneo was quite inaccessible by road, so we chartered our own aircraft. 
We took a small unit up to Mulu National Park, which is absolutely spectacular and has the most extraordinary atmosphere. When we went to Mulu, we wanted to compress huge vistas into a stereo space that could actually fit into the theater. So we exaggerated space by putting the cameras three, four, and five feet apart. Watch cables coming around. What this has the impression of doing is shrinking the world or slightly miniaturizing it. So instead of seeing a, a vast vista that it, for all intents and purposes is almost flat because it's so far away, it suddenly begins to have dimensions and trees can be seen separated from a background that may still be many, many, many miles away. The end of the movie involves a, a glorious sunset that we had to be on standby for on a tropical beach for a number of days, which was really hard work. But what we were able to do is, while we were waiting for the sun to set, we also put together mini sets in which we released snakes and tiny little insects, and they would become part of the movie story later on. Here is a, a waggler's pit viper. It's found very, very close to the set. And we're trying to involve it in the shoot. It's got a venomous bite. It's got two very long fangs at the front of its mouth, which can project out the mouth and deliver a very nasty bite. So in the unlikely event of a landing at sea, uh, okay. what, do we, what do you want us to do? I want you just to back off so I can just literally collect it. So, I mean, if it's making its way across this sheet towards you guys, um, just literally take a pace back and I'll grab it. Be aware that it's on set and don't be tempted to move any branches. Okay. Mark it. Yeah, he found the horizontal. Oh, yes. Warwick, who's our wrangler, is so experienced that he gets himself into the mind of the insect and he's able to tell me precisely what he thinks it's going to do next. And eight times out of ten, he's spot on. The other two times, well, the insect takes over and does whatever it likes. Well, you know, actors are actors. So we'll just bottom a frame and gut through, that'd be Yeah, I think we'll just tease him around with a And would he go, would he go in the valley, maybe, or on the, on the edge? He can go anywhere. absolutely anywhere. Uh, it's so pr a pretty unpredictable. We well, we found this chap on one of the local plants. He's, uh, he's obviously living off different plants in the area, which we found on all sorts. Um, I'm not sure on exactly what he is. We think he's some sort of scale bug. Little is known about him, really, but he's quite cute, quite small, and quite bizarre, really. Raise it up, raise it up, raise it up. Raise there you go. Marcus. Marcus. There you go. Very good, very good. Can we, well, if we've done with that shot, can we, yep. we're having a job getting him, so can we snap the branch? Well, well, easy. Okay, it's in, it's in, it's in. Yeah, let's get him out of the light. sun. Can we have some dry leaves and stuff? Oh, how cute! Put him to the mic, put a mic on your neck. Right, yeah, give me the tip, because his, his antlers and his wings and I mean, all that type of good stuff is all Antlers. <laughs> We all know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Okay. It's okay. good. <laughs> Antlers, wings, the whole thing. We all get the gist. So we're down here at uh, Damai Lagoon, and um, the preparations for this shot have been going on all day. We've brought the lighting and the camera in this morning. The foliage you see over there has all been brought in. We've had people making the river change direction and uh, smoothing the sand down. So it's actually been a lot of preparation for what should be, I hope, a really good shot.
This is the Viper we used earlier in the last shot. Uh, we've used him and now we're going to place him back. On your way. What a shame to see it go. Is that a tear in your eye? It? it is actually, yeah. Okay, what we've got here is we keep all the pupae for Papilio memnons, which is one of our stars, the actual caterpillars through to adult butterflies. Well, you can see, like, this one, I would say, is pretty fresh, really bright green. Um, you know it's got a long while before it starts to hatch, well, to emerge, I should say. Um, whereas this chap here, you can actually see the dark wings which are already formed in there. And this chap here, which is literally due to hatch, possibly today. Two really important, technically creative people in this film. Uh, one was on board first, and that's a guy called Peter Parks from ImageQuest 3D. He was a, a, a very instrumental in the whole idea of getting off the ground because he's the only guy on the planet who can, who's got the machines to film stuff, you know, the size of your fingernail. He's won two Oscars. Technical Academy Awards for his work in large format, a couple of the machines that he's made. And in fact, I think the trickiest bit of the filming um, was then the, the transfer from the forest of Borneo to, to a studio outside Oxford where we rented a, um, a big industrial unit and filled it full of Peter Parks' gadgets and then the way that Sean Phillips, the director of photography, wanted to light it with dozens of huge lights and generators and air conditioning units to keep everything cool. The whole of this project for me started really when Phil came along and said, are you interested in bugs? And the answer was yes. But as soon as he said it, a whole lot of danger signals and flags and screaming bells and sirens went off in my head because I knew he was talking about large format and I knew he was talking about 3D. Is that kind of focus? Chris, <laughs> and then Peter's Where taking a framing and you're getting focus. So there's two brains yeah. working. To be able to make the decisions that everybody has to make about was it a good shot, was it in focus, um, you know, will the audience enjoy the 3D, it's very, very, very difficult. Game month is feeding. He's getting to the line pretty quick. Okay. Good, chop it down, stand by to roll. Whoa, oh, yeah. Are you sharp, Sean? Yep. Turn over. Yep. Off the bench. Sliding high. He's, He's, He's gone blow. He's still there, though. He's still there if you can raise it. Keep it sharp. The fact that it is giant screen and the fact that it's in 3D and we're looking at a monitor that is 2D, black and white, that's been one of my biggest challenges. The iWorks rig in Borneo uses two cameras, of course, a left eye camera and a right eye camera, and it uses a big beam splitter. And it is literally, it's about uh, 20 inches across. So when Mike said, I want to be able to get between this leaf and that leaf and creep up on a praying mantis, how on earth were we going to get this huge, great shovel stuck out in the middle of the set? The problems beset by the big rig, the iWorks rig, I felt I could solve by utilizing snorkel optics, which basically are long lens systems which just get the camera out of the jungle. So that, that got the body of the camera away from the blades of grass and the foliage and the insects. I could play the same trick, come from above with one, come from straight through with the other. But now all I was trying to do was not use a beam splitter to separate them. I was now able to use a wee little front surface mirror which was no more than a quarter of an inch across, so that Mike could say, not only here is my praying mantis half-filling frame, but there is the hut and bit of the jungle behind, and he could get continuity. Okay, good. The really important thing on an IMAX movie is to not let 
um, if you like, the tail of technology, you know, wag the dog of the film. It's very easy to let the technology take over. And I don't think we did on this film. I really think we mastered the technology and made it work for us in a, in a creative way. Okay. That's looking very good. Get yep. the focus on it. Go. Ready? Okay, you go to Ready? One, okay, go, Ready? go to one. That's all right. Just, just, you're wrangling in. Still not one, still not one. Okay, uh, Warwick, okay. you're going off. The most terrifying part for me during the making of this was uh, the mantis taking the fly. You're going to shift the beat or shift him? I sat there and it was very, very hot. The film was turning over very, very quickly. Yeah. And this mantis was just rocking towards the fly. And I knew it was hungry. I knew it would actually take the fly, but it was dependent on if it took it before the film rolled out. We waited and waited and the film was being burnt. Mike was giving me a serious look. And all of a sudden, just out of the blue, that extra step, and it just grabbed it, and it was just, it made my day, but what a, uh, just sweating away under the 18Ks, <laughs> but it, we got the shot. Behind me, um, the crew, which you might be able to see, um, are trying to get a horned toad to eat a cockroach. And so far, it's taken about three hours. And that's the average per shot. Um, it's very frustrating, and it's just a, it's basically a waiting game. Okay, if you're a little high, he's right on the food spot right now. Cut in G. Cut in G. It's too fast for the frog. Yeah, too fast. Okay, we'll slow nature down a bit. Okay. NG, it means no good. And it's the way that I'm able to very, very quickly tell everybody that we've got an NG take. Cut NG. Cut NG. Cut NG. Okay, bring the slate in, please. Okay, that'll be a reload. Yes, sir. The cost of the footage is phenomenal, and we're running it twice because it's in 3D. So every time I hear the cameras roll, and every time Alex, the producer, hears the cameras roll, we're just seeing dollars going by. So the quicker I can say NG, the better. Turn over. No. 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 Cut. Cut NG. Okay, okay cut NG. Turn over. Cut NG. I mean, there's so many shots on this film that I think are incredible. The mantis hatching was a, an amazing moment. A birth happening live in front of you in the studio. We had something like a two-week window in which we knew that the eggs would hatch at some point. Are we not ready? Yes, we are. But narrowing it down beyond that was pretty impossible. And the only time we knew they were actually going to hatch was when the first mantis started to pop out. So not a lot of notice, really. Turn over. The patience that's required and the nerve that's required from everybody on the crew just to sit and wait and we slowly creep up on the insect. Okay, one coming down now, second one coming down in a few seconds here. We have learned things about the insects that we have studied and filmed that we never knew existed. For instance, the praying mantises hatching. Uh, which was filmed on the mirror-fronted rig. And we were totally unaware that there's a skin change takes place between them pouring out of the egg case and crawling back up to inhabit the underside of the leaf. Scott footage. OK, we'll roll it out. This one coming. This one coming. This one coming. Come on. Yes! 
Yeah. <laughs> he did it! Oh, right on the rollout. Okay, very good. In the film, there are a number of shots that we're calling visual effects shots, and what they are are combined shots where we put two separate elements together. We have a shot of a whole load of butterflies against a shot of the jungle. The most straightforward way of doing it is to shoot a beautiful background plate then in the studio to release a handful of butterflies filmed against a green background. We can then separate the butterflies from the green background and put them over the jungle plate, much like doing a collage. Okay, everybody just fill up positions. The plan is to have about three or four of us um, within an enclosure, so we're going to have to lie pretty much on the ground to make sure that we're not in the shot. And on cue, we'll be releasing those as and when Mike feels he needs sort of more action in front of the camera. We can then enhance the feeling of 3D in the shot by taking the two eyes of the camera and separating them a little bit. which will make it feel like the butterflies are right out in the audience. Hopefully when the shot's all together, people will be grabbing around for these butterflies flying out in front of them if we've done our job properly. There are some very interesting surprises when you're working in 3D. There are shots that are in 2D. You would think, well, perhaps, you know, it's a good demonstration of animal behavior or of the insect that you're, you're looking at. But in 3D, they have a particular beauty. For instance, there's a shot of uh, two beetles walking in the desert, leaving trails. It's quite a wide shot. The beetles are quite small in screen. And it's an interesting shot. It's quite an amusing shot when you see it in 2D. In 3D, it has a particular beauty that comes from the surface of the sand. You can see the ripples in the sand, feel the depth of those ripples in the sand. You can feel a sense of the dune moving up into the screen. And the beetles themselves are really just sitting on the sand, so real um, that uh, it, it gives you a, a, a totally different uh, experience when you're watching it and a great deal of pleasure, uh, much more than if you're just watching the, th the shot in 2D. And that is the beauty of 3D. This is the things that come out of the 3D experience. OK, speak. Well, the film is currently in its uh, late stages of editing, and I'm looking at the cuts now as they come together. Uh, some of the things that are really stand out are the close-up of uh, insects eating, which is really quite extraordinary and uh, requires a strong stomach. And uh, those scenes, I think, will be fantastically uh, interesting for kids, and they're going to love them. Uh, there's also some beautiful, beautiful uh, sequences uh, uh, particularly the mantid hatching is just phenomenal, a beautiful uh, little bit of nature unfolding right in front of our faces in 3D. It's wonderful. I mean, there's so many shots on this film that I think are incredible. Probably the best one is the, um, just because I couldn't believe the scale, was the um, Papilio caterpillar egg hatching, which is the size, I mean, it's absolutely tiny, this thing. It's like a dot. We had that blown up to the size of the IMAX screen and saw the life going on inside the egg, and it's quite awe-inspiring. And then watched that little caterpillar hatch out. That, to me, was just incredible. Are there supposed to be thorns on this plant? No. no. Oh, that's the whole thing. Apparently, they, although they look like thorns, they don't live on plants that have thorns. Oh, OK. Which, but, but that's still their defense, is that critters just, other critters Well, what I guess they do is they, yeah, they, torn, they turn thornless plants into ones with thorns by being there. This is the ultimate in method acting. They really are thorns. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of shots I'm very happy with. Uh, a lot of shots that were challenging and paid off really well. Because it's performance-based, the real stars of the, of the film are the bugs. 
you have to wait for them to perform. So it can be very frustrating to spend half a day doing a setup and lighting it and, and waiting for the performance to happen. And when it doesn't happen, of course, it's very frustrating, but you just have to go back at it. And eventually they do perform. And the bugs in this film, I think, have turned in a great performance. An uh, Oscar category, uh, which doesn't exist, but probably should. That's it, rest on mine. We'll see if we can get him to walk across. The fundamental audience for large format films are families, and those really range from 8 to 80. <laughs> and my hope for this film is very simple. Uh, it's that that audience have as much fun and find this film as fascinating to watch as we had fun and found it fascinating to make. Because on this shoot we're working with wide format all the way down to ultra macro, we need uh, quite a large number of different size slates. This is the big one we use for our wide angle shots. It's the next one down. This is the one we use for our dangerous wild animals like scorpions and tarantulas. And this is the one we use for our ultra macro shots on the optical bench. <laughs> 